All right. Well, um, hello, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us today. Um, I'm just going to dive right in and um, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end as well, as um, Greg and Andrew have said about being able to ask any questions in the chat. Um, so let's see this. I want to um, use this time to talk about um, the history of natural dyes and uh, celebrate some artisans around the world who are using natural dyes um, in a historical and modern context. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about how I got into this field, if it was choice, fate, or anything else, um, as well as some of my current professional and creative projects. And at, we'll end with just a couple of tips if you are feeling inspired to get involved in natural dyes. We'll just have a couple of tidbits of things you can start to do at home. So um, one of the things that excites me the most about natural dyes and textile arts is the depth of history we have around fibers. It is so uh, beyond, I think, what we can even comprehend how old these skills are. So um, the oldest string we have found uh, is 50,000 years old, right? Five, zero, 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 zero. Um, and that's, it could be much older than that. But even looking at the step of taking natural fibers, spinning them into something that can be then knit or woven, and then adding color to that is something that I was really shocked when I first learned how old even that practice is. So um, some of the earliest fragments we see of natural dyes existing are from this particular cave. I'm do not speak very great, um, you know, but the Duzduana, Duzduana Cave in the Republic of Georgia, um, they found all of these tiny, tiny bits of fibers left and uh, colors that represented practically the entire rainbow. And these fibers were dated at over 30,000 years ago, which is, I think, really beyond what we think of as uh a time when people were considering, I want this fabric to represent something about me. I want this color to say something about me. And in the context of these fibers, they also found um, a lot of artifacts of like weaving, signs of people weaving, and um, really celebrating and using a lot of skills that we have today. So I never get over the fact that um, these skills are so old because they go beyond a time uh, that any definition we as people use to differentiate ourselves or culturally exclude ourselves or cultural specificity, this, these skills go beyond anything that we today have used to differentiate ourselves in terms of culture um, or practice. And so it's just a, it's a real human tradition to be um, engaged with cloth or textiles. And um, I, I never get over that. I never get over that. So um what I want to do for the first part of our time together today is celebrate some um, and demonstrate the ways in which these um, traditional skills can be seen all over. So, um, so I want to feature a couple of artisans that I have had the joy to um, work with both in person and through the beautiful uh, web connection that we're able to have today. And one of the, um, farms and natural dyers that I'm really excited about is the Dijza organic farm um, that's in Mexico and uh, it's in Oaxaca. And the Dijza, um, sometimes to outsiders are called Zapotec, um, but Dijza is um, the cloud people. So they're indigenous people to Mexico and they have the um, ancestral practice of working with cochineal um, and lots of other dyes. So um, Samuel and his mother Leonor are really fabulous people. I've been um, in touch with them for a couple years now, and they um, host the organic farm where they do traditional agricultural practices, growing um, corn, working with natural dyes, and weaving on some of the early looms that were brought over from Europe. And um, uh, the wealth of knowledge they have is really fabulous. So 
They um, share both their language and their culture through their textiles and support um, in a very community um, active way. They support and represent a lot of the weavers in their community, and they do the take on the work of selling the rugs that have been made by people in their community because ultimately it takes a lot of people to make to make a living from textiles. Um, one of the other really fabulous things that um, their farm is an example to is how um, indigo is a dye that exists around the world. So um, we hear of indigo in the context of Japan and Shibori. We hear of indigo um, in within India, within many, many, many cultures across the African continent. Um, and even within the Northern European context of Wode, we talk about indigo. And what I love is that even in Central America, we have uh, our own indigenous indigo plant that this farm also works with. So um, indigo, it's everywhere. And I'm going to repeat that phrase a lot for you all today to show how um, these practices go beyond um, specific regions. One of the other artists that I'm really um, excited about and grateful for right now is Hona Bailey. He's a Maori um, textile artist. So he lives in Aotearoa, which is the Maori name for New Zealand. Um, and he also travels uh, back and forth to Hawaii very often. And he um, produces traditional um, garments and textiles using all of the traditional methods. So um, one of the um, demonst like demonstrative photos that I have of his here is working with this kind of like a grass material that they use to make pew pew, which is these um, traditional skirts that they're wearing. And we can see how this is um, on the far left, just the grass as it's been processed and kind of like the fibers have been scratched so that certain areas are gonna take the dye more readily. And then this middle section has been dipped into um, tannins, or tannic acid. So that's the same kind of material we would see from sumac or black walnuts, um, oak galls, which have been used in the European um, setting for ink, just about, just about everything. And then this very um, particular technique um, of immersing the fibers in mud that is really rich in iron and minerals. Um, so this technique that we see, um, the Maori name is paru, that's the name for the mineral mud, but we see this kind of um, interaction happening uh, between mud and tannins. Um, in West Africa, there's a really strong tradition of mud cloth, which some of you, if you dove into textiles at all, may recognize that name. Um, we see this locally. I'm based in Nebraska and the Pawnee people um, of this region historically knew where they could find mud that was really rich in these materials. And they too would dye various textiles black by integrating maple twigs that they would make a bath out of with this mud. Um, the list goes on and on and on of regions and areas where people have discovered that the dirt around us can create color. Um, and you might be wondering, why is Leslie talking so much about mud right now? You know, what, how, how did anybody figure that out? And one of the things I absolutely love to imagine is how did anyone discover natural dyes? Well, we're not going to find out because it was 30,000 years ago, at least. But what we can look at, both through the um, span of people who have engaged and discovered these processes, is really what we're looking at is... Um, the way that we as humans can be creative problem solvers, the way that we are innovators and we can, you know, come up with solutions to our problems. And I think that's something that we don't necessarily see a whole lot um, these days in terms of like, oh, I observed this thing in the natural environment and I'm going to elaborate on that and explore with that to create a solution to a problem. So the idea of just noticing how, the sun moves, you know, in your garden and figuring out where's the best place to plant certain plants in your garden, that um, problem solving that you can connect to in that way, perhaps in your home life is very much related to the noticing that, oh, when I put this plant in this mud here, it, it turned black and that's so beautiful. And we can use that um, as a way to create ornamentation. 
um, or create a different function out of these materials. So that kind of um, ability to troubleshoot and also apply materials and um, creative thinking and observing that across the world is something that keeps me very engaged in this craft over time. Um, and the ways we can use that for cross-cultural conversation, I find to be very fascinating. So the next artist I want to share a little bit about, um, I had the very great pleasure of getting to have a studio visit with Shogo when I was in Sweden last um, fall. And Shogo Hirata is a Japanese and Swedish textile artist. He grew up in Japan, um, but studied in Sweden, has been living there for um, quite some time now. And he makes um, a lot of interesting uh, kind of conceptual garments and then also um, works with natural dyes and traditional processes, exploring the relationships between Scandinavian design and weaving and um, his own Japanese tradition. So. One of the things that he's been uh, working with a lot recently that I'm pretty excited about is another way of achieving the color black. Um, so in this photo on the right, um, he's working with traditional Japanese soot. Um, so you can use soot as a natural dye and um, just kind of exploring the longevity of those colors and um, the way that you can use this waste product as um, a dye material. And so he's got been working on that in the background a lot, also using this to create a lot of visual art and like gallery based artwork. Um, and some of the collaborations he's done um, have included working with traditional woven designs, um, woven motifs we see in the very famous Rosengong and other types of Scandinavian knitting, um, excuse me, weaving. Um, and then working with weaving mills back in Japan to create textiles that have the illusion um, of being woven in this way, but have been made in a very particular way called ikat or resist dyeing. So um, if you're familiar with um, ikat at all, that's wonderful. If you have no idea what that means, I would love to explain what that means for you. So um, Ecot is kind of a fancier word for um, tie-dye, one of the fancier words of things that falls into the tie-dye category. So the idea being that you can take yarn and section off, wrap off areas of the yarn, and then immerse it in a dye. It could be writ dye, it could be natural dye, it could be whatever you want it to be dyed in. And then when you remove those resists, um, again, like a rubber band on tie dye, you end up with white areas that can be used to create the illusion of a pattern without having to have engineered a pattern through weaving over, under, over, under, or through, you know, changing colors while you're knitting um, or anything like that. So, what's really interesting about these beautiful designs you can see on this fabric here is that all of those lines, all those white areas have been perfectly tied off before they were dyed to create this, um, this beautiful pattern that is, um, was featured um, in a gallery in Japan and was really cool because it involved a lot of these cross-cultural conversations, involved a commercial scale mill and um, really, really exciting what it's bringing together. And um, I teach a lot of workshops where we get a little bit into shibori or resist dyeing. Um, if not with yarn like ecot for weaving, then a lot of times we'll do that as surface design on scarves or clothing or things like that. And um, the reason I wanted to share this image is, again, to point to it's everywhere. Resist dyeing, it's everywhere. This idea of um, creating pattern on fabric through clamping or tying or painting on rice paste or adding wax like batik. Um, these are ideas that exist everywhere that humans have kind of come up with to solve um, problems and to express beauty um, and excitement about the world. So Anytime you get into textiles and natural dyes, you can look very specifically at one culture and just have to turn your eyes 
you know, to the periphery, there's always going to see something like that reflected um, in, in other cultures and interpreted in different ways. Um, and it's my great joy to discover these things and share them um, in the context of working with institutions like the Vesterheim that is kind of, you know, Norwegian um, and Nordic based, but the way we can use that to celebrate so many other um, traditions around the world as well. So um, now I want to share a little bit more about my practice and journey. I'm thoroughly a Midwesterner, so I will try to talk about myself um, here. But um, you may be wondering now, wow, she knows a, like, a lot of weird information. We got some encyclopedic knowledge about a lot of different places. Like why, why would you want to meet all these? Why are you interested? Why do you go to Japan? Or why do you go to Sweden to meet a Japanese artist? Well, you know. Why did I start doing this in the first place? Um, I wish I, I will endeavor to tell you. Um, I started just as a textile artist and I said, eventually I will keep it to textiles. And what that has meant for me is that I now have an Angora bunny as pictured here. Um, thank you to the Vesterheim for introducing me to the person from whom I got my Angora bunny. Um, so you can be interested in textiles and suddenly have a fiber pets and animals um, and it all comes full circle. So um, my textile journey, um, in addition to growing up, I grew up in a household that was very interested um, in craft and problem solving. My dad um, is an artist um, as well as just a tinkerer. He's very interested in learning and trying things out. So we grew up doing band weaving and, you know, the occasional underwater basket um if not just to see could we figure out how to do it and so there was a lot of kind of creative inquiry in the home I grew up in and when I went to um university I studied at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter Minnesota and became interested in the Scandinavian Studies Department and in that time um I ended up living in Skatungbyn in Sweden which is um, a very small village of 300 to 350 people. Um, it's located in central Sweden. And when I was there um, the first time, I was there for nine months. And um, the course I was in focused on traditional craft, um, historical regional farming techniques, and um, kind of community living. So. Um, our coursework was in a, a small schoolhouse and we learned about sorting potatoes and planting potatoes and cooking food with local grains. Um, we had blacksmithing. There were folks who got into woodworking um, and we got to uh, weave as well, as you can see on the right here. So we were weaving the traditional vadmal um, cloth, which is used in um, traditional dresses. So it's a woolen cloth that's been fulled. And um, we got to work with local, you know, um, sheep farmers. We got to meet local musicians and it was a very um, rich program. There were only 18 people in the course and um, it's, a, it's a Swedish program. So I was one American living amongst 18 Swedes trying to learn all these strange words. And for years, I didn't know the parts of a weaving loom in English. I just know how to talk about it in Swedish. And sometimes I still kind of uh, jump back into that. Um, so the, the language experience was really interesting to think about how we talk about craft in our own language as well as in a second language. Um, I really loved spending time in Skatungbyn and was able to go back several times. So I was able to um, take the experience I'd had there working with craft and expanded that into um, independent research for which I also received a fellowship after I graduated. Um, the special thing about Skatungbyn is that not only do um, does everyone speak Swedish, but the elders in the village speak a language that is essentially going extinct called Orshamol. And, um, you know, I was young and thinking, how can I put all these things together? So I did a, created a fellowship wherein I went back to um, this region and spent a lot of time with these elders recording stories about their language while learning craft. So I would go to the weaving studio um, with this lovely group of older women and we would talk about weaving. They taught me twined knitting, which is a, or tvoen stickning, um, 
for which the Vesterheim does have classes. Um, and it was a really fun knitting technique that's unique to that region to create a very dense fabric that can survive the harsh winters there. So um, the, the interplay between craft and language and community and humanity um, also was a really big role in that for me in the sense that we're talking about words that people don't use anymore. Um, one of my favorite uh, conversations I got to participate in or witness was um, the discussion of a, a name for traditional clothing. It's like a, it's a jacket that's turned inside out of a sheepskin. So the, the wool is all inside and the leather's on the outside. And between these two towns that are working to kind of preserve their languages, there's a great argument between if a kosunj is a jacket or is a skirt. Um, so just to be a part of these conversations where people were working on preserving their culture um, and the craft associated with their culture and talking about farm implements that no one uses anymore um, was very engaging um, and really, really kind of changed the trajectory of how I was thinking about things. Um, so the school that I was involved with in Sweden doing this was the Mora Folkhögskola. Um, so it's a folk school. And as you may be connecting the dots here, going from one folk school in Sweden um, made it easier to think about how I could come back to folk schools in America. So we went back and forth between a couple of folk schools, um, and I'm going to show some pictures of those in a minute here. But um, the way that I continued to travel and um, meet people working on the land um, also kind of was back and forth. So I came back to the States, I finished my degree, um, and then I immediately found a way to get out again and um, was a volunteer on an organic wool farm in Wales, which was really exciting because we were working with rare breed sheep that were also facing extinction. So I lived in um, at Istrad Wool Farm, which is outside of Brechfa in Wales. Um, if you're familiar with Wales at all, it's outside of Camarthen. So it's kind of um, a little bit central, a really picturesque area. Um, and it was really interesting looking at regenerative um, use of land in the sense of how do you have pasture that's not sprayed? How do you get certification? Um, and how do you um, create a product um, with wool that preserves a breed, even if it's not the the characteristics of fabric that people want. Like we're very kind of spoiled these days. We like to have soft things against our skin. And for most of human history, it has been a luxury to have soft things against your skin. So um, this sheep on the on the right for any sheep nerds listening in, this is called a, a hill radna. Um, and they're kind of a wool quality um, sheep. And so uh, Juliet was working with this wool and also doing some crossbreeding with organic Wensleydale um, and colored Wensleydale sheep, which is a very curly, lustrous wool kind of like this. And, um, you know, how can we create a product that's pleasant for knitters to use, pleasant for weavers to use, and also um, preserves the stories of these animals. So um, we went to Sweden, we went to Wales. Um, I'm not even really talking about Scotland today, um, but, finding different ways to learning in different structured environments. So that when I got back to the US and kind of really settled down, which has probably been maybe about seven years ago now, um, longer than that, um, I spent a lot of time seeking out communities that were like these experiences. So some of those spaces were, um, led me eventually to the Westerheim, which is one of the newer additions that I'm very grateful for. Um, but I spent time in Northern Minnesota at the North House Folk School and um, made my way down to North Carolina where I've spent a lot of time at the John C. Campbell Folk School, um, both learning and then eventually as an instructor. So I've done residencies down there and I'm an annual instructor and um, just connecting with people in all different crafts um, has been really rewarding. Um, some of the things that I was able to learn in the US, I wasn't able to learn when I was abroad and kind of have done this full circle thing. So on the right, we see a picture here of a warp weighted loom or a stainy loom. And um, I was able to learn this skill here in the US um, from one of my mentors, Elizabeth Johnston, who's a 
um, Shetland based artist. She grew up in Shetland. She's lived in Shetland her whole life. And she um, is a specialist in historic techniques um, as well as natural dyeing and knitting and weaving. And um, that connection came full circle as I got to meet her here um, as opposed to abroad. And um, traveling throughout the folk schools, meeting people at the folk schools um, as a originally as a as a learner and now um, as an educator is really what keeps me the most interested in what I'm doing. Um, it's fun to teach and I never get more inspired than when I have just taught a workshop and I'm getting to see all of the excitement and results that everyone participating has made. I want to go home and make more, you know, as if I had time, but, you know, I'm like, I want to keep exploring, just seeing the way these, these things come together. Um, and one of the reasons I think um, folk schools are very important is because they're one of the few venues um, in the, you know, kind of American infrastructure where the focus is not on what have you made? What is the, what is the result on paper after this experience, but rather it's, I went, I explored, I tried something new. It might not have been comfortable for me to do. I maybe know nothing about it, but it's a really supportive, non-competitive environment where you just get to play um, and create in a way that I don't think we're encouraged to very often um, from day to day. So the relationships that I've been able to make through that, that work have really, really, um, you know, kept me kept me interested and kept me pursuing those. Cause I meet, I meet professionals who have also dedicated their lives to preserving and learning craft. I also meet, I think even more important than the professionals are the people um, perhaps like you who are just at home doing this for fun. And that's, that's how it should be. This is a human um, right. It's our, it's our right to know um, how to engage with textiles and how to make textiles. This is as demonstrated, it goes so much beyond um, you know, who owns this knowledge? It used to be everyone's knowledge. It used to be everyone's knowledge. It's more unusual that today we don't know how to spin yarn. We don't know the difference between a spinning wheel and a weaving loom linguistically. Like we should know that. We should have access to that information that shouldn't be kept secret from us. And it's really just in the last 200 years that this has kind of disappeared from um the common language um, in our own culture. So um, if you have not been able to participate in any folk school programming um, in person or online yet, I very much encourage you to do so beyond this webinar. Um, most places have scholarships as well um, to make that accessible. Um, so that's where you'll find me. Thank you, Andrew, in the midst of our webinar for being such a fabulous, um, fabulous folk arts um, coordinator for the Westerheim. Um, it's folks like that that make this all possible. Um, so as I said, everyone should know this information. And one thing I don't like to do with um, the information I've learned is seeing gatekeeping around it. So um, I want to take a couple moments to talk about uh, moments to talk about some of the people who have led me to the point of being a full-time dyer. Um, Martha Owen is one of the first um, people I met when I came back to the U.S. who really showed me that this was a viable living. Um, and she's based down in North Carolina. She's a shepherdess, natural dyer, and fiber artist. Um, and um, she's taught me how to use some traditional spinning equipment. Um, she's encouraged me to keep trying. Um, she's experimented and she's really just um, does a lot to build fiber community across the U.S. Um, and um, if it wasn't for her kind of richness of storytelling and music sharing, I think I, you know, she really was the person who kind of sparked some of this for me as like, I could do this. I could do this um, instead of having an office job. Um, some of my other local mentors who I'm very grateful for, um, Wendy Weiss is a natural dyer and an ecot weaver. Um, she was um, until recently um, a professor here at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in the textiles department. And um, she does really, really high level ECOT weaving um, as we talked about that ECOT being the resists. So she's mathematically planned out this weaving on the left here to produce these designs. So when she's weaving, she just goes. 
and this design appears. Um, she's um, also done some really interesting work with um, kind of sound and textile um, immersive experiences with Jay Kramer. Um, she's traveled a lot to India and worked with a lot of um, local artisans there. Um, and I feel so fortunate that in this large, large country with natural dyers in lots of places, um, Lincoln, Nebraska is not the place that people think of as being a hotspot for natural dyers, but there are at least two of us. And it is such a gift to have um, a resource like that around me. Another person who's really pushed me to um, carry on, helped me dealt with um, how do you, how do we try to be artists? Um, what is, what's it all about is Shelly Thornton. Um, and Shelly Thornton is a professional art doll sewist. Um, she's also an illustrator. Um, she's a part of the like National Doll Makers Guild. And um, she's always been really inspirational in kind of a funky sense of using what we have, um, pushing textiles into a conversations about art, which I think is happening a lot more now when you look at um, the art programs um, around the country and academic art around the country, people are finally kind of taking textiles seriously. And for a long time, if you made something out of fabric, you were not considered an artist. It was folk art, it was textile, it didn't, it didn't count. And um, Shelley's been involved in a lot of work and conversation over the years about um, taking textiles and bringing them to a, um, an art level, talking about the materials and textiles we're making um, in art language and gallery language. And um, I feel very fortunate to have these people around because uh, the truth of being a living handcrafter and a full-time handcrafter is that um, sometimes it can feel a little bit lonely. I don't have coworkers. I don't have um, an office I go to with lots of people. Um, teaching is my chance to be around people. Sharing with conversations like this is my chance to be around people. And so um, yeah, I think people are excited that someone's trying to do it. And also the reality is that it's very challenging. And um, from a personal level, you have to be willing to problem solve on your own and um, having the community of other makers, whether or not they're doing the same thing as you is always um, really important um, to remind us that this is, this is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, this knowledge should be for everyone that this, this, this um, livelihood should, should, should be something that's, that's worth investing my time in. Um, so um to uh, move forward from that, and we'll take questions in a little in a little bit here. But um, the big exciting photos, I would say, for my current work. Um, currently, um, I am I run a small, tiny, a tiny business, a tiny business. Um, so I do a couple of markets, and I have a website where um, I'm interested in making it easier for folks to access naturally dyed materials. Um, emphatically, I am a person who does not think you have to do everything from scratch. Unfortunately, I can do most things from scratch because my curiosity led me there. But I very strongly believe that there are ways in which we can use naturally produced materials without having to personally be responsible. Because um, realistically, you're probably not gonna like grow the fiber wash the fiber, card the fiber, spin the fiber, dye the fiber, knit the fiber, and then wear your sweater, right? We don't, we kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking to do things like that. So I really enjoy making materials accessible. So I carry naturally dyed yarns. Um, I provide dye supplies to people. I'm also a national distributor for um, Osage, which is one of the really fabulous natural dyes from the Midwest that produces a fabulous golds and greens. And um, yeah, just, just working with folks who are doing this at home because knitting is in the home, spinning is in the home, you know, weaving is in the home. And so helping people access to make, have access to this, both um, practitioners who want to make materials at home and then finished items for people who are interested in being able to wear naturally dyed items. Um, like these um, raw silk robes on the left have been kind of a, passion project lately, um, but helping people connect to handcraft and traditional craft, meeting them where they're at. Um, you know, you don't have to want to learn how to knit to appreciate 
you know, a, a silk scarf. You don't have to want to grow the dye plants to wear um, a naturally dyed silk scarf. And so meeting people where they're at is something that I'm really excited about. Um, beyond the kind of entrepreneurial side of things um, is the next really exciting slide that I'm leading up to. Um, I have also um, worked with a lot of clients. And so this is Patagonia. And um, one of my absolute favorite clients to work with, we have been working on several projects that are creating sustainable drag um, looks. So uh, this is a project that was uh, filmed and videographed by the National Audubon Society. They flew to Nebraska with a team of three to four videographers. Um, our director of photography um, used to be uh, a videographer for a very famous pop artist, uh, a rap artist named Macklemore. And it was this kind of celebrity experience um, for humble me living with a rabbit in Nebraska um, and um, challenging this notion that drag um, has to be made out of plastic, which a lot of um, drag culture looks, they're made, you know, there's cost is a thing. So there's a lot of materials that are just made out of plastic and we wanted to challenge that and see how much can we do um, that is involved um, with natural dyes and natural materials. So for the fiber folks listening in here, this project um, was over 260 yards of 70 inch width silk fabric that I dyed with marigolds and Osage that I grew personally. And the wings have been dyed with um, local, locally harvested walnuts. Um, part of the challenge we um, looked at was um, how could we create this impression of feathers on the back of the wings um, in a way that was manageable to make, to cover the surface area um, and to add some of the dimensions. So um, this is kind of my favorite part of the project actually is this look over here of the back of the wings. Um, the fabric was cut into spiral ruffles and then hemmed. And so I had dyed a base layer on it before it was cut and sewn. And then after it had been cut and sewn, I had to refold the fabric and clamp using those resist techniques we talked about earlier and immerse into some mineral mud or iron rich material to create, to go from the gray to the black. And um, lots of steps going in there to kind of create this texture to look like the back of the, the metal arc feathers. And that's one of my favorite parts of this dress. Unfortunately, the glam front shot is the one everyone sees, but um, this this bit on the back here really combining a lot of techniques. Um, the crew um, is on the right here. That's Patty Goni in the middle. Um, and um, it was just so fabulous to work with uh, the whole National Audubon team. Um, and my co-designer for this project, who is really like fabulous, this is Joelle Tangen. Um, and she and I work together um, and have worked together on progressive looks for Patty, some of which are going to be released later this month. And I can't show you pictures of that yet, but I would just say keep an eye and an ear out for those. Um, and so that's a really fabulous partnership that Joelle and I have here in Lincoln, um, working with Patty, who is also originally from Nebraska. And um, this work has been really rewarding because it, um, it's, it's creative, it's kind of art, it's kind of sculpture. I wouldn't spend as much time on projects like this otherwise, because I, as many craftspeople, we find ourselves in the middle of paying for rent and um, making the things that bring us the most joy. So I feel very fortunately situated um, in, this, um, in this relationship with Joelle and with Patty. Um, some of the other projects that we've gone on to make beyond this one, um, I dyed a range of greens, which is actually a surprisingly not straightforward color um, in natural dyes. But um, we've done a lot of projects where I'll just dye fabric for a look. I'll coordinate with one of their other designers. And then um, this look was created by um, his designer, Grace, um, incorporating all of those colors. Um, this was a project about reclaiming the word pansy. Um, and, uh, Grace hand painted this beautiful, it's like a paper mask that's painted there. Um, so it's been really fun to have, um, natural dyes featured in such a, 
um, public and large setting. Um, Patagonia has a following of about um, like a half a million people on Instagram um, and other venues and has been on panels with Bill Nye the Science Guy um, and at the Smithsonian. So it's kind of exciting to to get to see the the humble natural dyes, um, you know, able to take center stage in some of these larger national conversations. Um, and later on here, I'm going to share about some other places where um, we see natural dyes kind of making a splash um, in the in the big ways. But um, if you are feeling a little bit excited or curious about trying to add some color to fabric now, um, this is a great time for this webinar. It's June. It's the beginning of summer. We have time. So um, the best way to start is to plant marigolds. <laughs> the best way to start is to freeze those marigold flowers, um, Coreopsis flowers. Um, you can dry a lot of plants. You can start saving your onion skins. There's a lot of information online for free. Um, there's also... Um, a lot of kits online that you can access if you're not able to source materials, but you just kind of want to dive in from day one, you can get beginner natural dye kits. Um, and of course, there's so many online and in-person classes, um, which are really a joy to teach. Um, if finance is a barrier to you, the online classes are really fabulous. The ones that we teach here with the Vesterheim always involve a kit that's mailed directly to you. And that's really fabulous. And the in-person experiences um, at Vesterheim or at any other um, venue you're able to take one are, are really great to connect for connecting in community. Um, now, as I've said, I try to meet people where they're at. So you may be enjoying this presentation and thinking there is no way <laughs> I'm going to start doing that. Well, I have a solution for you. Um, if you don't want to die trying to die, um, some brands have started um, working with upcycling their own textiles and naturally dyeing them. So the big name here is Eileen Fisher. Um, Eileen Fisher uses a lot of linens, a lot of nice fabrics, and they have this um, new subset of their company called Eileen Fisher Renew, where they actually will take gently used items from consumers They'll bring them back to their studio and they will either mend, repair, or also naturally dye them. So they have a really fabulous partnership with Botanical Colors, who is one of the um, kind of premier natural dye suppliers um, and also does custom work for a lot of brands across the country. Um, they carry my Osage um, chips, and which is such an honor. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to see a commercially available business taking responsibility for the way that textiles are a part of um, part of consumer waste and doing something about it. Um, so if you're curious about kind of finding naturally dyed materials and clothing, et cetera, Eileen Fisher is a good place to look. Um, or a quick Google will show you several different uh, companies that you may you know, find different styles for. One of the more regional and smaller makers I'm really excited about right now is Badger Face Fibers. They're based in um, Northfield, Minnesota, um, and they're a fiber mill and um, have a beautiful flock of sheep. And they are producing yarns and roving. And they're one of the only mills in the U.S. that is any color that goes through the mill is naturally dyed. So they have a natural dye test plot. Um, you can also go harvest dyes there yourself, like kind of pick your own pay by the pound natural dyes and um, rovings that are naturally dyed as well. Um, so Teresa Bentz is absolutely fabulous. I'm really excited about the work she's doing there and um, uh, looking forward to seeing how that continues. Um, outside of the Midwest region, we also have Stony Creek Colors, which is a really big company um, in the Southeast part of the country that's producing commercial scale um, yarns, or sorry, not yarns, but um, natural dyes for production use. Um, and the last thing I want to say about um, where you can find dyers is Etsy um, or Fair, which is another marketplace, um, does have a lot of small kind of indie dyers um, working with natural dyes. And um, if you have any questions about where to look or how to get things after this, please feel free to connect. But I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Um, and I could go on for quite a while here. So I'm going to just go down to a quick keeping in touch um, thing here, which I'm sure our fabulous tech crew can share in the chat for us. Thank you. 
And um, I will hand it off for questions now. Yes. Excellent. This has been just fabulous. Thank you so much, Leslie. So one of the conversations that's been happening in the chat has been people talking about their first experiments with natural dyes, onion skins, moths, chrysanthemums, just experimenting with things. And so one of the questions is, what's something you've tried that has failed horribly as a oh. natural dye? Oh, I love this question. Oh, thank you. Okay, what has failed horribly? Well, in a, in a webinar like this, you're only showing us the bright. I know, I know, I know. I have so many. That's why I'm pausing because there would not be um, success without many, many failures. I would say the one that I revisit the most, I didn't, I haven't really personally spent a lot of time with, but my biggest thing about, as I'm teaching as a professional, um, I encourage you not to try cabbage, not to try red beets, not to try black beans, because you will even see new, beautifully photographed natural dye books being published today, even in Sweden, um, that are suggesting that these are viable natural dyes. And um, the chemistry shows us that the um, the literal compounds that produce that color are not like fast. So the fastest way to be disappointed is to put something really fancy into something with red cabbage. And I only, I tell you that not to be afraid to explore, but so that you just don't put, you know, a $200 silk slip in a bath and it will be purple and beautiful for two days and then it will be gray. So mulberries, I would say mulberries. I had I had a good mulberry experience of failure. And that is the same category of reds. You know, the sexy colors are the quickest to disappoint. So just be cautious about those ones. Um, we've had other failures. I burned silk, you know, I mean, <laughs> I've uh, we've we've had we've had so many mistakes, um, and that's what you learn. That's the best way to learn. The best way. Yeah. Excellent. Another question that's coming in is, what are you excited to tackle next? Oh my. Um, okay, so I was recently gifted um, from my friend Shelley Thornton, who I talked about, a needle felting machine. So it looks like a sewing machine. Um, but it just has a compound needle and, um, I'm excited because it presents me for me in the art part of my brain, a way to combine written word and some of the like personal poetry that I write into textiles in a way that's like immediate. Cause I don't want to sit here embroidering poetry. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not done for that. And so the immediacy of working with a needle felting machine, um, has been really exciting. Um, and, um, there's some other, you know, dra there's always some more patty looks in the works and I'm trying to get some Nuno felted materials in there, which would be really exciting. Um, so kind of incorporating like traditional folk craft, continuing to incorporate really niche, um, folk school vibes into the drag world is definitely something that I'm excited about. Um, yes. Great. Can you talk a little bit about uh, there are dyes, dye materials that are local to you and dye materials that come from far away? And can you share your thoughts about that? Yes. How, how you justify using one or the other, pick one or the other? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, um, and this kind of goes back to what dyes have you tried that did or did not work in the seventies when there was a really big folk arts revival and natural dyes was coming back in a big way. There were a lot of publications that were excited about using what you have in your backyard. And for most of us, what we have in our backyard is going to make, and I truly mean most of us anywhere, regardless of where you are at, what is in your backyard is probably going to make kind of a boring yellow because yellow is the most prevalent color in all of the natural dye plant world. It's from flavonoids that exist in plants everywhere around us. And um, the sexy colors are the hard ones to get. And when I say sexy colors, I mean blue and I mean pink and I mean purple. Like those are the colors that people have murdered for, you know, those are the power colors that have um, really influenced our global economy and trade. 
for thousands of years. So um, I think when I first started, I was very interested in using what I could pick out of my own yard, what I had around me. And then at some point, you just want to make the color red. You just want to make pink. <laughs> and when you want to make red or pink, you know, you can try hibiscus tea. And I'm going to say it's in that category of like, it's all right, but it's not what I want to, it's not what I'm going to dye a sweater with because knitting a sweater takes a hundred hours or whatever. And um, I don't want to waste, I can't waste my time on that. I can't afford to waste my time on that. So things like indigo, matter, cochineal, um, you know, those, those two blues and reds of the primary wheel, I think are the best ones to get out there and you can find, you know, sustainable sources, um, transparent sourcing. Um, I sell those materials, botanical colors, sell those materials. Um, you can work directly with small farmers as well. So, uh, Stony Creek colors again, has a lot of those too. So, um, don't be afraid to go out and purchase something, um, because, uh, yellow is great. You know, orange is great. But there's a lot of other fun colors too. And it only takes a little bit to make that to make that red be pink or purple or whatever, you know. So I think it's pretty fun to um, you know, it's 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 a part of the way people have done it for thousands of years to trade this stuff also. So that's part of how I justify it too, is it's like the trade has been going on for much longer than we have. <laughs> yeah. Who is asking how large is your studio? And I know you've had a journey of multiple studios over the years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so maybe share a little bit about that. Yeah, I will be fully transparent about that. Was that Susan? Thank you, Susan, for asking. Um, yeah. So uh, I very proudly have a tiny studio. I very proudly have a very complicated studio right now uh, because my business burned down a year and a half ago. So the last year has been kind of a kind of a mess of um figuring out how to get the studio to work but um i don't have a huge fancy space and i never have and i think what's cool is how much you can do um in your kind of ugly decrepit basement so most of that fabric that was in the metal arc dress that yellow was dyed in a trash can <laughs> a new trash can but you know i was i was like i don't have a pot that big we'll just use a trash can and i know how to you know experiment and apply the chemistry to solve the problems and just got to be hot enough for long enough. So you can do a lot in a really small space. Um, part of the way that I work too and make this manageable is like, I don't, I don't run a brick and mortar. Um, that would be the first way to not be able to afford to be a natural dyer for me. And so I work, um, out of like spaces that exist in our community, either as formal like community spaces or like working with a homeowner and I'll like use part of their basement or something like that. Um, but you don't have to have a gorgeous fancy space to do gorgeous fancy work. Great. I think we have time for two more questions here. Irene is asking something that feels like it relates to figuring out how to die in the trash can. Don't you have to add chemicals to the natural product? Can you talk a little bit about the tinkering that goes on as a dyer? Yeah, so um, this kind of a question, I'm curious, Irene, when you say chemicals, you know, what chemicals is a complicated, interesting word um, that I've kind of originally was very like, oh, I don't want to add, you know, things that seem weird or dangerous or whatever. And um, there are certain metallic minerals that are naturally occurring minerals that contain metallic salts like alum um that work as the glue to adhere natural dyes to the fabric and so different dyers have different feelings about working with a material like that um for me it's been in use for at least 7000 years as a natural dye substance um it's naturally occurring we use it in pickles like it's it, you know it's it's the same as are in pickles Pickling alum, that's that's what it is. That's that's the secret glue for natural dyes is pickling alum. So for me, um, I don't consider that, you know, everything's either everything's chemical or everything's not chemical, you know, but I don't use synthetic materials. So when I work with indigo, I'm not using a synthetic indigo vat. I'm working with natural, um, you know, mineral mind, mind materials. Um, or ores to create that or sugars if you're going to do a sugar vat you know so 
Um, if you're like curious about asking people if they're using chemicals, in their naturally dyed products, I think, especially in that area, each dyer is going to have a different, a different way of explaining it to you. And you can decide what feels, what feels best to you. And then I think probably the trickiest question to ask any artist. Oh God, <laughs> I'm ready. Your favorite material to dye or work with. Oh, thank you. You have all the beautiful things. And now you have to pick one favorite. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> my favorite thing to dye. Well, I okay, protein-based fibers. So silk and wool. And dense fibers are my favorite because the color gets darkest the fastest with the least amount of work. That's my short answer. Is like I love a good raw silk. I'm never going to get over a good raw silk. The one other thing I want to add to this, though, is recently um, when I taught, this is maybe not the most fun, but it was mind blowing. Greg was present for this and Andrew was peripherally present for this. Uh, I taught a natural dye class, like a four day class at the Westerheim about two or three months ago. And one of our students brought in um, chicken feathers um, from her farm and also um, an Arctic fox pelt and a reindeer pelt. And she gave me samples of those. So I got to naturally dye um, Arctic fox and the chicken feathers, which are actually used in Maori weaving, which is what she's going to use them for. Um, that was so much fun. So anything that's made out of like nail, you know, keratin, that was the coolest, like, oh my God, it worked thing. Um, so yeah. Oh, I could talk about that. We should have, this should be a two hour webinar. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just all questions, you know? Yeah.